The van stopped in the shrine's parking lot. Also parked there were numerous other vans with loudspeakers mounted on top of them to act as makeshift propaganda vehicles. Propaganda! That's the word! I will not stand for this propaganda you're spewing about young Rika-chan! How dare you besmirch the name of the fabled Ferude family! Shame! Shame on you, Guy Pai! Shame! There we go. That worked out. That was a good bit. That was, that was a good bit. I worsened it by calling it a good bit, but I don't give a shit. This is a good bit. I'm gonna soak it up. On the side of each vehicle was scrawled, The Dam Project Must Be Demolished. Defend our homeland to the last. No Oyashiro-sama's anger. Or a slogan of a similar kind. They gave the feeling that even without using the loudspeakers, there was enough to overwhelm any onlookers. Vertical banners were erected in various places. The contents of those banners were similar. They were all objections against the dam, or crude insults towards the government. There were horizontal banners, placards, and so on and so forth. They proclaimed that without a doubt, this was the headquarters of the Onigafuchi Guardians. For Rika-chan, however, this hectic place was also her home. We've arrived. I'm home. Rika-chan crawled over my lap and exited the vehicle first. Makino had noticed that I was looking at protest banners. The shrine also has the offices of the anti-dam movement. For you, this probably brings back memories of the anti-security treaty complex back in the day. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I really, I really enjoyed that laugh. That laugh made me really happy. Oh, I'm corpsing hardcore. I am hardcore corpsing. It's making me less funny. Student movements against government policies, movements that bordered on terrorist activity, were at one time commonplace, if only in order to garner global attention. Students holding out in lecture halls, brawling with the riot squads that charged in. It was an age where wasting one's youth like that was widely considered a road to glory. It was slightly before my time. I'm not really an activist or anything. I studied without incident and graduated without incident. I don't really agree with the violence or occupations they use to protest the government's policies. Oh? You have quite the nice opinion there. If you have an opinion on a policy, vote for the candidate who shares your view, or enter the political world yourself and assert your beliefs in a lawful manner. That is the foundation of democracy. I don't think that's something you should cha challenge with violence. For a youngin', you have some fine beliefs. I saw that feeling of respect reflected in Makino's gaze. At that moment, something tugged at my sleeve. I have no idea what Akasaka is saying. Rika-chan, feeling like she was the only one who didn't understand the conversation, had a look of displeasure on her face. The expression was so charming, I had to keep myself from grinning like an idiot. It's often said that a father wants to spoil his daughter rotten. I think I understood that feeling very well. Sorry, it was a little bit hard for Rika-chan to understand, wasn't it? Japan is a peaceful country, so you have to argue your point in a peaceful manner. You shouldn't resort to violence, in other words. No matter how much I explained, a girl was just boasting... A girl who was just boasting about being able to carry digits over when adding things probably wouldn't understand. It probably wasn't something to talk about in front of Rika-chan anyway. So then, Akasaka, how do you think we should keep our village from being flooded by the dam? Even if I regretted my careless words, it was too late now. Here I was, at the main headquarters of an organization, telling them their way of doing things was illegal. Preaching. 
that violence was not the answer. A complicated feeling had mixed itself in with the respect in Makino's gaze. It was then I finally realized it wasn't that simple. There wasn't a soul who would argue that what I was saying wasn't correct. Using violence to get one's way was something that everybody knew you shouldn't be proud of. However, right now, Hinamizawa was in a predicament that couldn't be overcome with peaceful means alone. The legality of the Hanamizawa Dam project, through the efforts of the various propaganda campaigns enacted by the Onigafuchi Guardians, was being called into question. If they further strengthened their campaign, they might be able to suspend or change the construction plans. But that was at the most just a possibility. If the government proceeded with the construction as planned, it wouldn't be long before this place was at the bottom of a lake. If it wasn't for the unrestrained resistance of the residents of Hinabizawa, this place might have already been underwater. We can't live anywhere else other than here. We can't live in the city. The words of this remarkably young girl were all too accurate, carrying with them the screams of the hearts and minds of the residents of Hinamizawa. Of course, there was nothing I could say to respond to that. I could only respond to Makino and Rika-chan's heavy words with silence. I'm sorry. This isn't a problem that an outsider should lightly just poke their nose into, is it? I apologize. Makino, unsure of how to reply for a while, could only laugh pointlessly. <laughs> it's nothing that concerns guests that make their home somewhere else. If you enjoy it here, please tell all your friends that Hanamizawa is a wonderful place. Please. If word spreads to dozens, maybe even hundreds of people, then that ridiculous plan to submerge this place at the foot of a dam will eventually fall apart. He followed that with a smile that said, Please don't think much of it. Makino letting me not worry that much really was a stroke of good fortune. Becoming infatuated with the idea of making friends with a little girl had made me completely forget my apprehension at being in enemy territory. Being reminded of this right before I was going to step foot into their headquarters might have been a good thing. If we'd had this exchange in the middle of their office, if there was a short-tempered youth in there, they might have come at me. Thinking of how extreme they were, in the worst case, my life could have been in danger. It seemed that I looked quite despondent at that moment. Makino, thinking he had said something wrong, became flustered, trying to think of a way to improve my mood. I was a bit careless just now. I'm very sorry. No, don't worry that much about it. The sights you showed me around the village were all beautiful, wonderful places. I really do want to come here one more time. If this beautiful village is going to be submerged at the bottom of a lake, I can understand why you would fight so desperately. I'd somehow managed to use my despondent look to change the topic in my favor. After a bit, Makino had returned to his usual high spirits. It seemed he believed I completely sympathized with his point of view. Now, now, let's leave the talk at that for now. There's a place around here with a really great view. Let's go, Akasaka. Rika-chan, seemingly happy to be free from all the boring and gloomy adult talk, bounded up the stone steps. There was no real need to run, but in order to catch up with her, I also darted up the steps. There were several tents belonging to the town council erected on the shrine grounds. Inside the tents were several folding tables and chairs, and a number of the older town council members were livening things up with chit-chat. They weren't saying anything incendiary, like the dam project must be destroyed. It was just some relaxed, idle chit-chat between local geezers. The normal sort of calming scenery. At the entrance of a shed that looked like a meeting place, there was a large sign erected with Onigafuchi Guardian's headquarters written in bold brushstrokes. That was their base of operations. 
To be honest, it was a bit of a letdown. If you asked what I had been imagining, this is a bit embarrassing, but I'd have thought it would be something much more dramatic. With barbed wire fences and barricades. My first impression of the place, though, was completely different from that. It looked like a simple backwater town hall. It didn't look like anything other than exactly that. This is where the Irish terrorists are operating from? I don't know why you got so hung up on them being Irish. And you're really hung up on that car bomb from the from the post-ending scene. That really, really stuck with you, huh? The old folks who were chatting had noticed Rika-chan's presence. Well, if it isn't Rika-chama, it's time for little kids to head on home. This is my home. The old folks guffawed, since she wasn't wrong. From that exchange, I could tell that this Rika Ferude girl was loved by everybody. Makino-san? Who's that? The tourist who phoned? That's right. That's right. This is the mayor of Hidamizawa, Mayor Kimiyoshi. He smiled brightly, but there was no mistaking he would be scary if he got angry. By the looks of things, this old man was the president of the Onigafuchi Guardians, none other than Kiichiro Kimiyoshi himself. Welcome to Hinamizawa. What do you think? It's a quiet and relaxing place, isn't it? Y yeah I was able to appreciate a multitude of beautiful places throughout the whole day. I'm thankful for being granted this rare opportunity. Hmm. Even if you're one of those youngins, you're quite the gentleman. Mm-hmm. Kiichiro, I want to show Akasaka a cool place. Thinking that the formalities between myself and the mayor had gone on for too long, Rika-chan butted into the conversation. For her to call the mayor by his first name, I felt it was a little strange, but none of the villagers seemed to mind. A girl of the Furude household, one of the three families. She was probably different than the average villager. Akisaka, over here! Rika-chan tugged at my sleeve. Not resisting, I allowed myself to be pulled over. And waiting for me was a magnificent view. This is... amazing. It was an observation deck that looked down on the village. They, knowing that this was the best view in the entire village, kept quiet as I stood there, awestruck. I was holding a camera, but had completely forgotten to even glance through the viewfinder. This view... No matter what kind of film it was printed on, it wouldn't be able to show everything. If there was a way to explain it, it would only be what I would be able to put into words. It was just such a breathtakingly spectacular view that I struggled to find a comparison. For a while, I was left awestruck. I could only stand there and wonder. A cool breeze helped abate the heat rushing through my body. That comfortable sensation also, also left me speechless. Rika-chan, who had been holding on to my sleeve the entire time, spoke. This is my favorite spot. As she said that, she showed me another adorable smile. That smile seemed very fleeting. If you ask why, that was because the view from her favorite spot would eventually be submerged under the deep green waters of the Dam Reservoir. I just can't believe that this village is going to end up at the bottom of a lake. I said it quietly so that only Rika-chan could hear it. I regretted it as soon as I did. For those words were all too cruel. However, Rika-chan didn't let them cast a cloud on her expression. In fact, she replied with a smile. It won't sink. The dam project will definitely go away. It was just like a little girl to say something like that. 
There was no basis for her saying so. It was just her wish. Akasaka, do you think that this village will be submerged? It's not that I want it to be. I knew how important the dam was. I knew that it was necessary. I just didn't want to recognize the sacrifices that would be made. I agreed with the project in general, but couldn't agree with some of the details. But, if it meant that this girl's beloved scenery wouldn't be taken away from her, I might be able to object to the dam. I might be able to ignore the interests of the nation, the development of Japan, all for the sake of one girl's smile. I'm not really much of a humanist, but... How sentimental of me. It won't be submerged, because the dam project will soon go away. Her words weren't just hopes and dreams, but were seasoned with a hint of resolve as if she was talking about an unchangeably predetermined outcome. As surely as the sun rising in the east. It'll be gone soon. Wanting to ask her why she believed that, I turned around. Yes, it'll be gone. What makes you say that? Well, you see... She seemed to want to answer. But as though unable to find the right words, she swallowed back what she was about to say. Regardless of what Akasaka does, the dam project will end this year. It's already been decided. That was a lie. If something like that had already been decided, then the Onigafuchi Guardians would have no reason to continue existing. From my point of view, it was like they were doing nothing more than throwing themselves into an endless battle. If they knew the damn project was cancelled, it would feel much more relaxed around here. This village, though, could hardly be called relaxed. For evidence of that, I just had to remember how charged the atmosphere was at the checkpoint, or at the bus stop. The villagers, with their misplaced resolve, were still fighting. And this girl, even knowing the villagers' grim resolve, had already declared their victory. The villagers, throwing themselves into this endless war, and this optimistic girl who said they had already won. That contrast was somehow strange. Why do you think that? If you know something that makes you that confident, could you tell me? Rika-chan stayed silent for a while, seemingly choosing what to say. Because... Because... She looked like she was lost on whether she should continue or not. As if she was troubled on whether it was okay for her to say it. That kind of expression. It's already been decided. There's no other way to say it. it it's already been decided, huh? It really is just like a little girl to say something like that. I couldn't believe it was actually true. She was the only one saying such things with such confidence. My real mission, that I had forgotten about during this fun-filled day, resurfaced at the back of my mind. The kidnapping of the minister's grandson. Had the Onigofuchi guardians kidnapped the minister's grandson and already succeeded in negotiating the cancellation of the dam project? Did Kimiyoshi actually already know that and was just playing dumb? Was that what this girl was really telling me? Akasaka? The girl called out my name suddenly. What is it? Go back to Tokyo. Huh? I wasn't only surprised at that sudden command. Ever since I came to this village, I had never once mentioned I was from Tokyo. Well, based on my accent, she might have been able to guess where I was from. What was I getting so worked up over? It was probably the sudden and complete change in her demeanor. You should definitely go back to Tokyo right away. If not, you will woefully regret it. The girl had been holding my sleeve the entire time. She'd been tugging at my sleeve since hurriedly dragging me over to show me this wonderful view. But this was the adorable Rika-chan, who I'd spent the entire day with. 
There was no way she could have been replaced with a doppelganger when I wasn't looking. She had been holding on to my sleeve this entire time. But somehow this girl was someone other than Rika-chan. She looked like Rika-chan, but she wasn't. She was some girl I had never met before. That girl had told me in, a diff in an indifferent voice that I would eventually regret coming to this village from the bottom of my heart. That would be an incredibly pathetic thing to see, so I thought I'd warn you right now. Why would I come to regret it? Stop whining. I couldn't believe that I was hearing such cold words come from Rika-chan's mouth. I just couldn't believe it. Was somebody impersonating her, using ventriloquism or something? Thinking that, I wanted to take a look around, but... The girl's gaze had me pinned down, making me unable to move. When you tried crossing the road when the don't walk sign was up, did your parents finish explaining why it was dangerous before pulling you back to the sidewalk? They pulled you back right away, wouldn't they? They'd pull you back before explaining why it was dangerous, wouldn't they? In other words, it's something like that. The girl I had spent time with, Rika Furude, would not speak like that. She would speak with acuteness befitting her age, with brief, childish remarks, expressing, expressing her emotions honestly. She definitely wouldn't speak with such pointed words. I've warned you. Don't get the wrong idea. It's not like I'm saying this because I hate you. You don't need to tell somebody who's better off dead that they're in danger. Who are you? You're not Rika-chan. Hmm? <laughs> as soon as I accused her of not being Rika-chan, she let out a strange, quiet giggle. It was a laugh not befitting a child of her age. It was like she was possessed by something. Her change was just that, total and complete. Was Rika-chan being attacked by some terrifying phenomenon? That occult idea came to mind without any sort of hesitation. Rika-chan is acting strange. Somebody, help! Thinking that I'd yell that, I turned to where the mayor was. I immediately realized he was looking at us with a smile. That's right. To him, it looked like nothing more than me and Rika-chan fooling around. He didn't notice that there was something terrifying happening to her. Akasaka is such a coward. <laughs> the girl had obviously grasped that I was afraid. Noticing that and calling me a coward, she laughed again. That cackling girl, approaching me in a strange manner while still laughing, lost her balance and fell flat on her face. Rika-chan fell down. If it was just a while before, I would have extended a hand to help her up without hesitation. But now, extending a hand to this ominous girl who looked like Rika-chan but wasn't, required a bit more courage than I had at the moment. Meep. The girl cried out thus. She then squirmed upright and dusted herself off. Afterwards, she looked around restlessly as a blank expression crept across her face. You've got to be kidding me. Was she making fun of me? That way of acting. It was as though, after being possessed by something, she had lost her memories of what had happened. You're joking, right? Rika... Chan? Meep. I don't know if Rika-chan had heard me or not. She just cried out like that, as if questioning herself. Hey, mister! Rika-chama too! Tea's ready! There's some snacks too, so please come and have some! An old lady wearing a smock was waving energetically from the entrance of the office. Hearing that there were snacks, Rika-chan's expression changed. Yay! A carefree smile. That was a familiar smile, the one that belonged to the embodiment of my ideal daughter. 
Any hint of the creepy girl that was just there, spouting sinister words, had vanished. Come on, Rikachama, wash your hands first. There aren't any manju here for dirty hands. I'll wash them real good. Meep. Rikachan responded with vigor, running off to the washing station that was along the side of the office. She stopped halfway, turning around to call to me. If Akasaka doesn't hurry up, I'll eat his share of manju too. They're steaming fresh. Huh. Uh. People who don't wash their hands aren't allowed to eat any manju. No matter how you looked at it, that was Rika-chan. Those words and the way she said them, no matter how you heard them, they were definitely Rika-chan's. Come on now, mister. You're the adult here, so show her how it's done. The old lady urged me to wash my hands. Without any resistance, I lined up beside Rika-chan at the wash station. Splish splash. I stared at Rika-chan, intent on washing her hands properly, like she had probably learned at school. Meep? Did I do something wrong? Huh, by wrong, you mean... How I'm washing my hands. I only got four gold stickers for it. I'm probably bad at washing my hands. <laughs> you're not doing anything wrong. If you're washing them that carefully, that's more than enough. But it's not, Akasaka. If you don't use a brush and clean out the dirt underneath your fingernails, you won't get a gold sticker. Um, hmm. Rika-chan, you're very diligent. That's something to be proud of. Nipa! I was praised by Akasaka. No matter how you looked at it, it was Rika-chan. There was no trace of that girl from before. Exactly what was what was that sinister girl? Rika-chan, what was the meaning of what just happened now? Just now, you told me to go back to Tokyo, didn't you? Did I say that? I was at a loss for words. She didn't remember what that girl just now had said. Like I would ever believe something as occult as that could happen. Like I would ever believe that Rika-chan could be possessed by that strange girl and say those creepy things. Rika-chan, you definitely said that. Meep. Her expression told me that, despite my saying so, she had no idea. She wasn't playing dumb. She actually didn't know. Exactly what was that just now? Just as Rika-chan had, I let a look of confusion creep across my face. The two of us, both looking like we had no idea what was going on, must have certainly been a humorous sight to behold. While partaking of tea and snacks, I was shown a propaganda film shot by the Guardians that highlighted their resistance efforts. Older folks talked passionately on how long and grueling the fight against the dam was, but they fell on deaf ears. I was transfixed by Rika-chan, who had heard these stories countless times before and was nodding off. Eventually, Rika-chan noticed I was staring at her and smiled as she rubbed her eyes. That smile was Rika-chan's, after all. There was no hint of that sinister shadow. After that, my unreasonable fear of Rika-chan lessened with the passing of time, but I could by no means forget what had happened. It eventually grew dark. The mayor said that they had pre prepared dinner, but I said I could come again tomorrow and took my leave. I had to return to the hotel and file my regular report with the section chief. I see. Well then, please come again tomorrow. If your phone, we'll send somebody to pick you up right away. I appreciate your hospitality. I'll probably come again and enjoy myself tomorrow. Yes, please do. It seems that Rika-chama has taken a pretty big liking to you. Akasaka, are you coming again tomorrow? 
I finished after fifth period, so if you could come at around three o'clock, that would make me happy. Please come again. The pure smile urged me to do so. There wasn't a trace of that evil aura. Depending on what happened next, all that might end up as... All that might end up as nothing other than my hallucination. Thinking about it logically, if the daughter of the Ferude household, one of the three families, had taken a liking to me, then this was a strong foothold for my investigation from here on out. No, you're dumb. You're dumb. It was like a free ticket for a reason to visit Hinamizawa. If only I could treat that little incident as a figment of my imagination. Then, having this girl, who was the embodiment of my ideal daughter, grow so attached to me, wasn't bad either. I'd successfully dove into the belly of the Onigafuchi Guardians, and had the mayor, as well as other important members of the Alliance, welcome me with open arms. This was a great turn of events. However, I still felt uneasy. Getting back to the hotel, I forced down an almost painfully cold beer until I could clear my mind. The shock from that incomprehensibly strange incident continued to torment me. Oh, is that the chapter? That'd be great if that was just the chapter. Then I might be able to fit three chapters in today. Wouldn't that be a boon? That's a lot of tips, man. That's so many tips. The sound of the car grew closer, followed by the sound of it breaking as the engine cut out. At that moment, his up-until-now lackadaisical footsteps grew decisive as the man in the room dashed up to the wall beside the window and carefully peered outside. It was his comrade's car. Even so, he still didn't relax his guard. Eventually, the sound of footsteps approached the door. Thump. 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 It was the passcode. I'm back. Open the door already. Ah, you must be tired. Ooh, what did that say? I'm opening it now. After the locks were undone and the door opened, a man appeared, his arms laden with swollen plastic grocery bags. The bags in his hands had Seven's Mart written on them, with bread and milk cartons able to be glimpsed within. The contents of those bags were then spread out over a sheet on the floor. I bought some cup noodles, so go boil some water. What's the kid doing? Hmm? He's been sleeping the entire time. Thank God he's not causing any trouble. He did struggle a bit when he was about to shit himself. Don't let him crap his pants. It'd suck if it started smelling like an outhouse in here. Yeah, I know. Check the gag every now and then. We don't want it to get loose, so keep it tight. But not so tight that he stops breathing. I said, I know. Huh? Didn't I ask you to pick up another can of gas for the portable stove? We're out. You never asked, you idiot. Gah, seriously? Come on, work. Damn it! He rattled the portable stove as he struggled to get it to light. Seeing that, the man who went to buy supplies let out a deep sigh, and with a backwards glance at that sight, began to walk to the corner of the room. The kidnapped boy was sprawled out on a sheet that was spread out on the floor. Boy, you doing okay? Of course, the man didn't assume the kid was able to hear that question. That was because the boy's ears were plugged, with his eyes and ears thoroughly covered by packing tape. Also, his mouth was gagged with a thin, twisted-up towel. Because of that, the boy was unable to close his mouth properly. His chick his cheeks sticky with his own saliva. Of course, that wasn't the only reason. Both his arms were tied tightly behind his back with a leather belt. You seem to be doing okay. At least you're not going to die. If your grandpa wanted to play tough, we might have had to lop off an ear. It'd be great if we don't have to. 
If the main family says we do, though, tough luck. I can even imagine. I can even imagine what kind of cruel things they'd have us do. That that family says not one scratch on them, though, so it seems to be going well for the time being. The minister is discreetly withdrawing the dam project. The Hanamizawa Dam is indefinitely postponed. I wonder when we're letting the boy go. I just want to be done with this already. The main family seem to be gauging that timing. I don't know when it'll be, but probably soon. Isn't that great, kid? He'll be let go real soon. <laughs> the men didn't know if their voices were heard by the boy. For him, there was nothing he could do but continue to sleep to escape his harsh reality. More importantly, what are we gonna do about the gas? We can't eat the cup noodles raw. If we're out of gas, say something. Jeez. Oh, dearie dear. Oh man, baby me on. Baby me on. I'm excited. Look at a little baby me on there. The weather forecast had predicted that it wouldn't rain at all this entire week. It's not that I hate sunny days or anything. When every day is the same, unchanging, sunny weather, however, anybody would long for a rain cloud or two. If it's simply clear skies for a week, a month, a year, anybody would long for a rain cloud or two. The weather specialist said that they had carefully scrutinized a large quantity of past data, so it wouldn't be so likely for the forecast to be wrong. I knew as much. But even then, there was occasionally a day where I was hoping that it would be wrong, as I stared up into the clear blue sky. Was I being mischievous and hoping so? I waited and waited, feeling almost suffocated by the boring blue sky undisturbed by a single cloud. If you could die from that suffocating feeling, then the population of Earth probably wouldn't have increased to this point. In other words, the only person who was being suffocated by this was me. And so, I welcomed the summer evenings where not even the weather forecast could predict a sudden shower. If I were to explain it like this, would you understand a bit more about how I feel? Let's say that tonight's dinner was going to be curry rice. But when you are called down to the dinner table, what was waiting for you was instead an eggplant and bell pepper stir-fry. This is just your mother's whim, by the way. I would be delighted by such whimsy. I don't really like eggplants or bell, pepper bell peppers, but still, I would be delighted. The fact that the pre-established routine of curry rice had been broken would be amusing. If tonight was repeated a hundred times and a hundred times you had to eat curry rice, yet... For just this one night, that was changed to an eggplant and bell pepper stir-fry. There's no way you couldn't enjoy that chance happening. I hate pre-established routines. I really hate when things are all decided beforehand. I have no love for boredom. I always get my hopes up that something today will be different from yesterday, no matter how trivial. It's been decided that this entire week started today was going to starting today was going to be clear skies. The weather forecast had decided upon it, so the god of weather must also feel obliged to do so. But who's to say that a rain cloud might not just show up one day on a whim? It's something that nobody can say for sure, but because that thought remains in this world, a creature such as myself can continue living without being suffocated. Tomorrow will probably be a hot and clear day. However, I'm the only one that knows that predetermined fate. Even with but a slim 1% chance, sometimes changes. Hoping for that 1%, I hung up upside down upside-down weather charms on my sunlit eaves troughs. In the end, I spend my days waiting for those unexpected things in life to happen. 
I pondered why I was hoping for it. Why was I hoping for a rain cloud? The answer was simple. I've had my fill of clear skies. Then why was I hoping for a rain cloud? The answer was simple. The fact that it was going to be sunny tomorrow was boring. So why was I hoping for a rain cloud? In the end, it doesn't really matter whether it rains or shines tomorrow. Basically, it was just that the rain would water my heart, which was withered from boredom. That's why, rather than a TV drama where the plot's already been decided, I prefer to look up at the sky. I don't know... I don't know why that turned into a into a monologue by the Joker. But you know, I was digging it. I was digging it and it fit. Okay, it's time. I'm excited. Your blood pressure has improved. For you to recover this quickly at your age, I'm rather impressed. At this rate, you'll still be kicking after a couple hundred more years, or you son. The young doctor in his medical coat said that as he undid the blood pressure cuff from the arm of the old woman tucked away in her futon. You're a very good physician, physician Dr. Irie. If a persistent old fart like me doesn't hurry up and die, I'll just be in the way of you young folk. <laughs> The old lady, Oryu, laughed faintly with a broad smile on her face. Then, turning towards the sliding door, she called out in a strong voice, Is Shimiko-san or Teiko-san there? Bring some tea for Dr. Irie. The sound of rushed footsteps from the hallway drew closer, until finally the door slid smoothly open. What it revealed was a young girl. It looked like the old lady's granddaughter. Shimiko-san already left for the day. Do you need any? Do you need something? Mian, make some barley tea for Dr. Irie. Okay, got it. Did you want some too, Granny? Or would black tea be better? Want lots of milk and sugar? I'll measure it out myself so you don't have to put any in. Just bring the sugar jar and some milk when you bring the tea. KK. The girl named Mion, after giving a rather uninterested response to her taskmaster of a grandmother, returned to the hallway. Pour the doctor's tea in the cups for the guests, and make sure you bring a coaster, too. Also, make sure to dry the outside of the glass, okay? Yeah, yeah, you're such a fussy pants. A tired voice wafted a reply from down the hallway. The apathetic tone of voice was far from unusual. The old lady let out a wry smile slip the old lady let a wry smile slip across her face as she chided the girl. Jeez, that girl just won't learn. Nothing I ever scold her about sticks. Now now, Oryu San, you don't have to say that. Mion Chan is doing her best in her own way, even though she's so young. Her mother was the same way. Couldn't teach her anything. Oh, no! The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. <laughs> Fuck! So, her mother's mother must be exactly the same, no? The old lady burst out laughing. Her expression showed she hadn't taken the comment the wrong way. Dr. Irie, I'm sorry, but could you open the doors for me? It seems there's a nice cool breeze outside. The cool chirping of the Higarashi had at some point started leaking through the gap in the doorway. Irie stood up and opened the door a bit. A refreshing breeze pushed out the stale air that had built up in the room. It's gotten fairly hot during the day, but the evenings are still rather cool, aren't they? It was almost downright chilly last night. Yeah. Chum. Those types of mornings and evenings are another one of Hinamizawa's fine points. Irie replied with a smile as he returned to sit on the cushion beside the old lady. And then the two of them, for a little while, 
soaked in the voices of the Higarashi. I'm going to try and live to a hundred. Until the business with the dam is proper finished, I ain't kicking the bucket just yet. To get the government to withdraw a decision they've already made is a fairly difficult thing to do. The way this country does things is like turning a millstone. A heavy one at that. A millstone? Don't you know? A millstone! Irier quickly affirmed that of course he knew what the old lady was talking about. For he knew full well that Oryu didn't like having her stories interrupted. This millstone, see, can grind anything to a pulp. It's rather impressive. But you see, it doesn't turn that easy because it's a rather heavy millstone. Lots of people have to work in unison to get it to even budge. It's that type of millstone. Irie pursed her lips, listening quietly to what she was saying. Pursed his lips. Pardon me. Eventually, Mion returned with some tea laid out on a tray. Seeing that Oryu was talking and in a good mood, she quietly knelt down and laid out the sets for the barley and black tea, careful not to interrupt. That's why when it gets going, it's not that easy to stop. It takes the most effort to move it right before it starts turning. Everybody hates that, so everybody keeps pushing it along without rest. You're talking about friction, right? I get what you're saying. So in other words, if there's some sort of mistake and the millstone suddenly stops turning, to get it turning again takes a great deal of power, more or less. Certainly, to get a project that's been suspended going again takes quite a lot of work. It's a millstone that isn't easily stopped. But once it's stopped... It'll never turn again. It's that kind of millstone. It'd be nice if there was some way to get that millstone to stop, wouldn't it? When Irie responded with that, Mion and the old lady suddenly sunk into silence. Irie, instinctively thinking he had said something rude, searched in a small panic for the words to correct himself. But that silence wasn't the result of rude words. For what crept across Mion and the old lady's faces were contemptuous smiles. <laughs> the atmosphere surrounding Irie suddenly froze, leaving him flabbergasted. Thinking about that, s about the scornful smiles creeping across both their faces, was the result of some mistake of his. He could only grow afraid. <laughs> it hadn't been that long at all since he was enveloped by silence. However, unable to stand it, Irie could only let out a weak laugh. Irie's laugh eventually spread to Mion and the old lady, not knowing exactly what they were laughing at. Their laughter left a lingering chill. The only ones not laughing were the Higarashi who continued their simple and unchanging chorus. All right. Well, that was a really good chapter. That chapter gave me everything I would have wanted out of it. Um, for those of you watching on YouTube, though, that is going to be the end of this video. I hope you guys enjoyed. If you did, please consider subscribing to the channel, liking this video, and leaving a comment down below. Who's your favorite younger version character? I, I gotta give my vote to Rika-chan. I love Rika-chan. Rika-chan is perfect. And I'm, I'm really excited to see how she influences this story going forward. Uh... In the description, you'll find my followables. You'll find my Twitch. I stream on Twitch every Monday through Friday at 7.30 p.m. Pacific time until I stop. 
The time I stop at changes regularly. I choose it on a whim, but it's usually around three hours. Um, so come on, stop on by. I like to have a nice chill atmosphere where we can discuss things and have conversations. So I hope to see you soon. Maybe we can have a nice little conversation on stream. You'll also find my Twitter. I'm really bad at using Twitter. I'm trying to get better at it, but, you know, Twitter's really hard to use without people following you. Because just putting your thoughts out into the void seems weirdly pointless. I don't know. It's difficult. I'm not good at it. But if more people started following me, I'd be more incentivized to try harder. So consider go going and subscribing. Subscribing? Following. Following me on Twitter. That's what you do. You follow on Twitter. But uh, that is all of the train wreck self-advertisement I have planned for this video. So once again, I hope you guys enjoyed. I will be back tomorrow at noon with a brand new YouTube video. But until then... I will catch you all next time. Ciao for now.